Hey, welcome back to Spectre Creative, the world's only internet channel dedicated to Arbor Day, hieroglyphics, and all things toys. Well, today, like usual, we're talking all things toys. And today we're going to talk about yellow toy things. Well, sort of. I mean, yellow is usually the color we associate with happiness, right? With bright, sunny days and awesomeness and a good feeling, like when you get a new toy. Well, yellow can also be the bane of many a toy collector, and it can be the sole thing responsible for taking an awesome collectible and, well, making it slightly less awesome collectible. I'm talking about when the blister on an action figure or toy vehicle or doll or pretty much anything covered with a plastic blister turns yellow and basically ruins the fact that it's no longer in mint condition. Well, why does this happen? Is it because of evil anti-color gremlins from the 80s that are out to squash our hopes and dreams? Or are there scientists out there deliberately working to find a way to make yellow the most important color? Well, we all know yellow is the bane of pop culture in a lot of ways. I mean, the Green Lantern Corps knew this. They knew that yellow was the color of fear, right? And, and Marty McFly is well aware of being called yellow. And heck, no one knows the bane of yellow more than glowworm. Let's face it. Because nobody wants to see glowworm put behind a yellow blister. It's just... It just takes away all of the fun of Glowworm. Why would you do that to Glowworm? Why? We want our toys to look shiny and bright in package. We've wanted this now as collectors, and we wanted this, uh, you know, back when we were children collecting toys and doing what children actually do with toys. Well, so why is it that toy companies aren't able to keep toys from turning yellow? I mean, don't they want children to be happy when they get their toys? Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Well, it's a bit of a yes and a bit of a no. I mean, of course, toy companies want children to be happy with their toys, but they also want to be able to keep the toys preserved from the shelf to getting it to that child without incurring a huge expense. Because if they incur a huge expense doing this, they would have to pass that on to said parent or child or whoever is buying the actual product. The whole point of a blister back in the 70s was to keep a toy together. It was not about showing it off as a piece of art. The idea that toys were one day going to go on to become collectible and mounted on walls and put in museums and shared online and Instagram, well, none of that existed. Even, I mean, not just Instagram existing, but the idea of collecting toys in this way really wasn't something that caught on until the late 80s, early 90s. Yes, I know people will prove me wrong with individual ex examples, but bear with me here. We're talking, you know, mainstream. Hot Wheels was one of the first toy lines that really started to show its age, with older toys, older vehicles, really having those yellow blisters and becoming a huge part of the devaluation of a mint collectible for those who kept their Hot Wheels or action figures in box. Having a yellow blister essentially made the figure no longer collectible. So why does this happen? Why is it that toy companies are allowing these blisters to turn yellow after time? Again, not an evil plot and not rocket science. It's basically regular science. Science, well, science causes everything. So essentially, Plastic is a raw material that's used in a lot of toys. Other examples are things like rubber or zinc or die cast or even soft goods. Well, plastic is a very common raw material because it's, it's malleable. It can be changed, it can be heated, it can be molded, and it can be used to hold things together, such as a blister card. And it's relatively inexpensive to do this which is why plastic tends to be the choice, as opposed to packaging action figures in large metal cases. All right, so why is it, though, that plastic will degrade over time? It's basically a ex directly related to UV light, which degrades plastics. Plastics are made up of what are called polymer chains. So when UV energy is absorbed by plastics, it excites the photons in the material, which then create what are called free radicals. If oxygen is present, the free radicals form oxygen um, hydroperoxides. 
excuse my, my bad uh, sp uh, science there. So these um, hy <laughs> hydroperoxides break up the polymer chains, essentially what's called chain scission, meaning that the, the polymers that are held together, sunlight is essentially causing them to break apart. And there's multiple types of plastic. You've got large plastics, microplastics, and what are called nanoplastics. But all of them are affected by sunlight. And sunlight causing the photons in the molecules to basically move faster and faster, this causes the plastic to break up quicker and quicker. So the short version of it, the more sunlight that's exposed to plastic, the quicker they're going to break up. All right, so is there a solution? So obviously the biggest offender of this are blister cards because they're made of thin plastic as opposed to an actual action figure. And the blister card needs to be a reciprocal to get the toy to the end user, right? Just like the uh, Folgers coffee can and the end of Big Lebowski, you actually have to put it in something to go from toy aisle to, to, to child. You can't just hand them a, a, you know, a Barbie doll or a Hot Wheel from a loose bin. I mean, I suppose you could, but the idea is a child wants to get a gift, they want to unwrap it, and they want that exciting moment. That's why packaging is done. Well, it's also done to help with planograms, but it's part of the gift-giving experience. So eliminating the reciprocal is not really going to work. And no one really thought that Barbie was going to be frozen in carbonite and kept forever in packaging. That was never part of the thought process when packaging was designed back in the 70s and 80s. It was assumed that the packaging was just there to get the toy from aisle to child. All right, so, well, is there a solution? Kinda. And it's one of those things where you can either go big or go home or just deal with it. So, how do you prevent sunlight from degrading plastic and causing the polymer to break up? Well, have you ever heard of the whole store in a cool, dry place phrase? Basically applies to this as well. There's reasons that people spend millions of dollars on wine cellars making them the exact right temperature to preserve the wine because they don't want any sunlight or temperature change to affect it. Well, if that's what you want, if you want blisters that are not going to turn yellow and toys that are going to stay perfectly mint like the day they were made in the factory, that's kind of what you have to do. You have to build a room that's completely temperature controlled and monitored like a wine cellar, and that's not exactly cheap to do. Most collectors, this isn't exactly high on my priority list as far as expenses, but it is a solution. So will it counter yellowing blisters? Yes. Is it reasonable to think that all collectors out there are going to create a temperature-controlled collectible room? Uh, probably not. It's more one of those things where we just kind of have to accept that plastic yellows. And, you know, every once in a while, sometimes, you know, the nerdy guy gets the beautiful girl. It happens, but... We really have to just understand reasonable expectations in the world. So, that hopefully sheds some light, no pun intended, on why yellowing blisters happen when exposed to sun. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with others. If I missed any details, let me know in the comments below. Love to hear your thoughts, and I'll see you guys in the next one as we continue to explore the wonderful world of toys and yellow, and we'll throw in some Arbor Day stuff too. Thanks for watching.